I'd like to call the order on October the 5th, 2022, the PPRTA Citizens Advisory Committee. The purpose of the Citizens Advisory Committee, the primary objective of the CAC is to ensure the capital maintenance and public transportation projects and programs approved by the voters at the November 2nd, 2004, November 6th, 2012, and November 7th, 2017 ballot measures are accomplished with PPRTA funds. This committee reports directly to the PPRTA Board of Directors. All right. Uh, I'll turn it over to Rick to establish the voting membership. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, We do have a quorum, but let me read the names that I haven't seen yet to see if they're <laughs> online or in person. <clears throat> Scott Barnhart. Online. Okay. Tamara Dipner. Online. Thank you. Karen Aspelin. Uh, Jim Godfrey, are you on? Okay. Uh, Dave Zelenock. Uh, um, Bruce Colson and Calhan, Cindy Tompkins, Rama. Uh, Emily Magnuson. Okay. So one, eight, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So all alternates can vote. Um, so uh, we're in good shape and I'll watch and see if others join. And, and if we get more than 17, then I'll <clears throat> let Carlos and Tony know that they might be at risk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I need. All right. Thanks, Rick. Approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as we have in front of us? Tony. Tony has approved the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? A second. Greg Gooding, second. Oh. Craig did the second. All right. Thank you, Craig. All right. Item number three, public comment period for items not on the agenda. Do we have any public comments or anyone online for public comments? No comments in chat, um, no hands up online. All right, thank you. Item number four, approval of the minutes from the September 7th, 2022 meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, this is Tony, I move to approve the minutes from last meeting. Tony has uh, moved for approval of the minutes. Do I have a second for approval? Tamara Dibner, second. All right, Tamara, thank you very much. We have a second. All in favor of approving the minutes as presented, say aye. 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 Do we have anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Now our best report. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the sales and use tax is reported two months in arrears. The most current information I have is for July of 2022. So we were below the monthly budget by 199,000 or 1.4%. But overall for year to date, we are over budget by 1.2 million. July 2022 revenues exceeded July of 2021 by 625,000 or 4.8%. Anyone have any questions? Any questions on any of the financial information that's been presented in your packet? All right, hearing none, we move on to number six. Capital maintenance and public transportation contracts, City of Colorado Springs. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Gail Sturdivant with City of Colorado Springs, uh, City Engineer and Deputy Public Works Director. Uh, the city is pleased to bring five contracts for your consideration for recommendation today. <laughs> Will you? I'm trying to find the balance here because I'm told I sit too close to the mic and then too far for the mic. So tell me where the sweet spot is. Is it? Okay. Is this good for you too? All right. Let me start over. Uh, do you need me to repeat my name? Are you... You think you're okay there? Okay, no, good. Sweet spot. All right. So we the city is pleased to bring five contracts for your consideration for recommendation today. Um, I'll go through each of those five and pause for questions as we go through. Uh, the first contract is for the the Tut Boulevard Extension project. It is an A list project. Um, there is a location map included in your packet. Uh, this contract is to add additional scope to our consulting contractor. Um, classic consultant engineers and surveyors in the amount of $34,950.88. And this will cover um, that additional scope includes um, some subsurface and utility investigation um, and some additional drainage scope that we did not have in the contract originally. Questions on that item? All right. The next contract is for um, some expenditures underneath the city's roadway safety and traffic operations program. Um, this is for going to be for uh, minor intersection improvements really to improve both vehicular and pedestrian safety um, at multiple locations scattered throughout the city. It was most effective for us to bundle uh, those uh, together and we went out for an invitation for bid um, concrete experts. Uh, was the uh, the sole bidder? Um, I will let you know we had considered just pre uh, pre negotiated with concrete experts, but we thought that there was enough concrete companies that were on the city's on call contract that we wanted to at least make sure they all had the opportunity for fair and open bid. They did, and they just still did not respond. So if you hear complaints about people not doing concrete work in the city, that's not true. <laughs> um, anyway, so but we did go through an invitation for bid. It was a fair and open competition. Uh, concrete Experts was selected. It's three hundred and forty-two thousand five hundred and twenty-three dollars and fifty cents, and those are for a variety of different locations. Questions on that one? A uh, contract number three is for what I refer to as our special projects project manager. Um, this is a and I'll explain a little bit more about this contract, but I will let you know up front that as of today, we're not committing PPRTA funds, but I definitely anticipate using PPRTA funds for this role in the future. And what this is intended to do, this special projects project manager has been identified to help us deliver some of our more complex federal aid funded projects. Uh, we have uh, two right now that are in the hopper. One is for that South Downtown Rail underpass realignment, which is tied to the Nevada Tejone rail bridges, which were included on the A-list to your ballot. Um, and then we'll have Woodman Road um, as well uh, that will run from Powers out to all the way to US 24. It's a project I have in collaboration with, um, with Josh. Um, but right now, uh, we want to put this contract in place. We went through an RFP process. We had four respondents. Um, CPNY was selected as the vendor, and Zach Zone will be our special projects project manager. So you may see him in the future to come and do a presentation, uh, particularly as we talk about that South Downtown Rail and Press Realignment, because um, this contract is set up to have task orders. I anticipate issuing him a task order fairly quickly since we have the Chrissy Grant already to do the preliminary engineering and NEPA work for that project. Um, I've already programmed the monies in um, our CIP and, and we have remaining monies in this year's budget as well for that work. And then um, I'll share a bit of good news. Everyone keep your fingers crossed, pray whatever it takes. The mega grant, we heard some positive news on Friday where there's some questions. So hopefully we're at the end stages and we'll hear a positive award for that. And that would give us the final engineering and construction dollars. Probably way more than you needed to know, but I'm pretty excited about this project. If you couldn't pick up on that, uh, questions on that item? So, Gail, so this you'll award a contract to the company at this point, but with no task orders at this point. Right. I'm going to issue a task order on this right away, but our task orders, you know, my task order would be relatively small. So, this gives us the ability, to, we are allowed to issue task orders up to 200 thousand dollars without coming back for CAC or board approval. Um, I would anticipate 
uh, putting one in place for just under that amount to start with, but it's his costs a lot are also going to be eligible for grant reimbursement. So I just want to have the flexibility to have them under contract to be able to perform the services we need for that work. Did that did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, the city's fourth contract is for the North Cheyenne Canyon Bridge uh, replacement project, as you recall. And there's a location map uh, in this project. Uh, this uh, deals with three bridges that are on a North Cheyenne Canyon Road. Uh, the city had a, received a state grant to do the design for all three and then the re replacement construction for one bridge. And as condition assessments went, went through, um, we realized we had to replace all three bridges. So we were able to uh, pair um, the state grant monies we had with the emergency bridge funds to do that full replacement. Um, what you're seeing before you today is a change order that's going to pick up two things. The first is really a final quantity reconciliation, and we did have additional asphalt, concrete, and earthwork on that, so we're paying the additional uh, costs based on the unit prices um, from the IFB. And then we're adding in a channel restorations and NEPA, uh, channel restorations and plantings that are required from our environmental commitments. Um, so that we'll be able to wrap that project up. Questions on that one? All right. Uh, the city's final contract um, is for funds to be expended underneath the citywide intersection improvements traffic program. Uh, this is going to be for uh, engineering improvements for the next phase of evolution of improvements at the uh, Union Boulevard, Milam Road, and Old Ranch Road. Uh, specifically, uh, this is going to cover some sweat reviews, bid services, and engineering services during construction for that work. If you recall, and I think it was about a year ago, we brought a contract originally to do some interim improvements. If you've been up in that area, there is a stop sign configuration and it still keeps that free flowing uh, south, southbound to uh, westbound. It's really to kind of start making the next evolution of improvements there and improve the safety at that location. And then and I'm referring to that as the interim condition. We have a temporary condition today. This will be the interim condition. And ultimately at some point in time, we'd have a final intersection uh, condition, but that's probably a little bit further in the future. What, uh, Gail, what, in looking at your map there, um, what is the, the interim is what you're, we're talking about today. Yes, we want to advance the interim configuration. What is the final configuration going to look like, or have you made that determination? Yet? Well, the final configuration is, is actually dependent on a lot of other land use issues that may be going on. So the interim may end up being our final for 15, 20 plus years. But if there's some land use changes where we can continue building it uh, four lanes through that intersection and the tapering down, on Milam Road to the north. So if you recall, it's as Old Ranch Road comes in, it's a T intersection, Union goes to the south and we've tied back into all that development there with Cordera and Wolf Ranch. And then to the north is more of the historic Black Forest Road land use. And so really what this interim condition will make that signalize, improve the um, a lot of the safety in that intersection and really will taper right back down on Milam Road to that two lane section. If there's no real land use changes, on that area, that interim solution may end up being there for a long time. But if for some reason Milam were to be widened or have some other things going down to like Burgess at the bottom of the hill, there may be some other improvements in the future. So this could be, like you say, a couple of years, could be 20 years, what we're talking or about. Or longer. Or yeah. longer. Yeah. But it is important that we continue to improve the, the intersection safety improvements in that area. It, with the configuration you have now, I go through that intersection quite often, and it seems to be working fairly well as you reconfigured it compared to you know what it was before. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it works with the the next stage. Right. Yeah. Well, what you're going to do there? There's still some site distance issues in that area. We'll improve this the signalization. You know, it, it will be more of a traditional intersection as opposed to having those Jersey barriers around that sweeping turn that I, I mentioned previously. Um, there's a lot of other underground challenges in that area that you wouldn't think of too that really need to be cleaned up to make that truly work appropriately. You mean as far as 
like there's a septic system buried in what would be like part of the intersection there's some really? issues i mean we've got mailboxes that are in the road right away it's all sorts of there's myriad of things that really just need to be cleaned up to get that um in an optimum safety condition yeah i noticed the other day when i went through there um the the mail carrier was pulled off like you say in the center of the intersection taking care of the the mailboxes that are yeah. there and i'm going well how do the people get to those mailboxes that's a good question we're going to work on that. <laughs> Gail, this is Tamara. I'm excited to hear that this improvement is happening. I live up that way. And there's a lot of people who have struggled at that intersection, and especially the site distance. So very excited that this project is going. So is, has the design been completed? And this is construction dollars? Or where are we on the process? OK, I think I heard all your question, Tamara. So bear with me if I, I missed part of it. The okay. uh, so uh, we're finalizing design. We had originally wanted to, to do this next evolution of intersection improvements this year. I don't think that's going to happen. And we would be targeting to do something next spring, early summer. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chair, I did also have some questions on this project. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Gail, my question uh, here is that, uh, of course, the need for this intersection is because of all the development that is occurring over there. Mm -hmm. Is the developer of uh, Cordera putting in any dollars in for construction or design work, or is this all just falling on PPRT? And I think you've said this before, but I could not recall. Yeah, there, there is not any PP, there is not any developer monies involved in these improvements at this time. And, and the reason for that is why? Because, again, this, this intersection was because... <laughs> well, is it because it was in a county? <laughs> can, can you just can you just explain this? No, because no. the need for this intersection was the, was motivated by the development of Cordera, not not for well, other natural is, growth. I would area. say the immediate uh, driver was to have it to really provide relief for the Cordera area. But there's always been a plan to have relief for the Black Forest neighborhood to be able to use Union and Italian. And this is actually really before Josh and I, so I'm really giving him a little bit of a hard time. But my understanding is is that portion of Wolf Ranch came in that there was some challenges between moving into the city and access to county roads that um, really precluded them from making that connection back at the at the time. Uh, now the city has taken over ownership of that right away and we've sort of taken on this endeavor to make that um, make that connection. Okay, so it was in the long term, if I understood it, it was in the long term plan. And maybe it has you been, can chime yeah. in from the get Yeah, I mean, the question is going to come up, you know, when we have development occur that it should pay, pay its own way. And that's the requirement within the city, as we know, developers Absolutely. are required to do this. The, you know, and I've been through that intersection, um, well, kind of on a bicycle bike that way. And so, and it's all houses there, it's all development there in Cordera. And it just seems like it would be a logical uh, assumption just as a, um, a lay person that, that the, developer would then fund the intersection improvements to get in and out of there. You know, of course, you know, we do have the ingress uh, into the Black Forest area, and I could certainly see that. But but what seems to be pushing this is is the development. I just wanted to make sure that we're good stewards of our tax money here and that we're not externalizing the costs of the uh, uh, here for the development onto the taxpayers of the rest of the region. So again, it's just going to be a question people are going to be asking, you know, as we Look, as we mm -hmm. become good stewards of our tax dollars here, is why isn't the Cordera doing this? And uh, and it's and I'm just going to encourage you know that we stay on top of these things. This right. is a concern that I hear from a lot yeah. of citizens. And I think, and and on all fairness, you know, Josh and I worked this in Jennifer before Josh was here. As we have these neighborhoods coming in, we're looking at those connections. I mean, in fact, one of the items Josh and I are going to be talking about later today is Howells Road and the city take on ownership of that. So when a development may come in on, let's say Kettle Creek area, and they need to have a second egress in that area, they have the opportunity to be in the city right away and do improvements on there to help with that area. So we're very cognizant of it. Um, I think this is and it's an unfortunate long time issue that that connection was not made, but we feel like it's important to be made at this point in time. And that roadway union to the Union to Milan connection has been on the city's long range transportation plan, I think at least since 82, but we're probably getting long before or past my be able to rec recall when that's there. And I think it's also on the county's major thoroughfare plan as well.
Any other questions for Gail on these uh, five projects that she's presented today? Hearing none, could I have a motion for approval? I make the motion to approve, sir. Tamara, give me a second. Okay, Richard has approved or motion to for approval for these five projects. Tamara has seconded these uh, five projects. All in favor of the recommendations, say aye. 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 Do we have anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion approves unanimously. El Paso County does not have any uh, capital projects to present this month. So we will move on to the city of Manitou Springs and Manitou Springs has added uh, in the packet that you have, uh, there are two projects, but uh, the uh, Manitou has added a third project of which a copy has been um, presented to everyone here at the table. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Manitou Springs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dole Grabenik, city engineer for Manitou Springs. And as uh, was shared, we did sneak a item onto the agenda for today in paper copy. It took an act of Congress to do that. So we're grateful to be here so that we can get some of this paving done before the asphalt plant shut down. Um, I can't quite see which one you have as the first one on that agenda there. It's the uh, Canyon Avenue mill and overlay. Yeah, this is just a surface treatment project. For those that know Canyon, it's kind of that first street you come into in Manitou when you come into downtown. It's had a lot of utility work. We had the utility co company, company come through, do the patching. So that road is ready now for some new asphalt and some new striping. Um, we, that, that contract just got approved by our city council last night. And then the second project, if I can move on, um, we received federal stimulus dollars through PPACG and we used that money. And there were some people in Manitou years ago that had the foresight that as they were doing the big capital improvement projects through the streetscape improvements, they installed a bunch of uh, extra conduit. So this project is installing the rest of the conduit in the gaps. We have a gap where we have conduit in the east end of town, the conduit in the west end of town. This installs, um, this closes the gap with new conduit. And then this also pulls uh, 48 pair fiber optic through all of that. And so um, we didn't quite have enough federal stimulus money and Manitou money. So we're using our capital improvement money um, to kind of bridge that gap so that we can get the rest of this fiber optic pulled. So the goal that one day Manitou, we will have our own uh, fiber optic backbone through town. And then the third one is the one that we handed out the paper copy. This is just another surface treatment project on several roads within Manitou that we deemed necessary and appropriate to get filled and patched and cleaned up before the snow comes and the roads fall apart some more. Do we have any questions? Tony. I, I don't mean to be uh, obtuse here. Um, what, I, I must be missing something. What is the connection between the installation of fiber optic and transit? Sure. Oh, Rick, Rick has a comment. Okay. Uh, um, Tony, I had the same uh, question originally. So I did some research uh, I have a handout if, if enough for everybody here. <clears throat> I first researched the RTA state law <clears throat> and RTA state law in the definitions uh, allows for <clears throat> utilities that transport information. Um, and I have a handout that shows that if, if, if you'd like, um, okay, okay. Let's uh, let's let's we'll take uh, yeah. a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, the other issue is, and I'll bring them around. Um, the other issue is that the the word utilities is listed in Manitou's capital project, as you can see on the screen. That reflects the voter approved wording, which includes the word utilities. Um, so. 
between the, the state law definition that information utility, uh, um, transporting information via utility is allowed in the state law. The fact that the ballot, voter approved ballot in, for this project includes the word utilities. And the third piece is that the city of Manitou Springs will own the conduit and the cable. Uh, those are the three pieces that uh, I concluded <clears throat> allowed this to proceed and I didn't challenge it. I, I further <clears throat> spent a little extra money and with the attorney, uh, Jennifer Ivey, the, the board's attorney, and she has concurred with my conclusion. So I'll, I'll take a minute now and bring that around. And uh, I, like I said, I didn't mean to be obtuse. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, staying within the bounds of what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, since it all falls under, that's great. <laughs> I'm glad you researched this. Thank you. All right, do we, Richard? Uh, Larry, uh, I guess this is a question for uh, an individual I have the highest respect for, Rick. Tell me, uh, I, I remember that uh, <clears throat> uh, you uh, have informed me uh, a couple of times about the state law actually provides uh, you could uh, have a gondola. Yeah. Uh, yes. approved right yes I, yes sir in <laughs> fact it's uh it, it might be in in the piece of paper i handed to you but <clears throat> anyway yes that's true i i my question to you is have we ever not approved a project because it was outside uh did not matt uh, did not uh, uh fit in within the law has it ever been done since 2004? I'm beginning to think we have never done that. And I will have to say as a person who primarily is interested in building roads, not pathways, not bike lanes, uh, not conduits, not good, uh, uh, not good solids. Uh, um, so let me restate what uh, what I believe your question is. Have we ever approved anything? Have you ever denied? Oh, ever denied a project <clears throat> because it falls outside of the uh, what can be approved under state law? I'm not recalling off the top of my head, but there may have been. Mike Chavez out in the audience, do you remember since uh, you've uh, been with us? I think the uh, maintenance center building. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, that, that was the city one in year one in, in 2005. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excellent memory. So yes, there, there was one. I am delighted to hear it. Uh, I will just, uh, as a matter of jesting, it seems since we have Manitou Springs before us, uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, building in Manitou Springs. So, well, but, but anyway, you've answered the question. I'm delighted. I, I think we probably, I wish that state law would be revised. <clears throat> well, I, I need to revise my answer because the board did approve $350,000 uh, uh, for Manitou to rehab their public works building. But <clears throat> going back to uh, 2005 or six, uh, City of Colorado Springs asked for several million dollars for a building, for a public works building, and that was denied. So it's okay. so there was a yes recently and a no a long time ago. All 
All right. Do we have any other questions? So uh, do I need to uh, spend a minute and walk through my yellow highlights um, for, for e either of the two pages? I think it'd be beneficial for the people online. Um, excellent. <clears throat> okay, so the, the wording, the, the phrase out of the RTA statute, uh, which is 43-4-602 in the definition section, <clears throat> uh, has, has several paragraphs, uh, but I only included uh, one uh, for you here. The, the key phrase is any real or personal property or equipment or interest therein that is used to transport or convey gas, electricity, water, sewage, or information, or that is used in connection with the transportation conveyance or, or provisions of any other utility. So it's, it's declaring that the transportation of information is the utility. So that's, that's the state law allowance. Then on the next page is the the voter approved capital project name, which is Manitou Springs Downtown Sidewalk Drainage and Utilities Improvements. So the the legal hooks are first that the RTA RTA state law says that that a a utility that transports information is eligible. And then the second hook is that the voter approved wording for Manitou is uh, that uh, Manitou Spring downtown sidewalk drainage and utilities improvements. So the, that's a double hook that to me and to the RTA attorney allows this, particularly when the city of Manitou Springs is, is owning the conduit and the, and the cable. Questions uh, from the folks on online. Um, I just have one more comment. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with the wording that, that you've given us, Rick. I, I would just caution um, that if I were a Manitou voter, when I was looking at this, the, uh, fiber optic cable is not what I would have interpreted by of the meaning of the utilities there. Although it obviously is a utility, it can be. I. In, as a voter myself, I look at these things and I think of utilities that are typically included as part of roadways and so on. So uh, I just want to be careful because we do have to answer to the public and uh, we should probably be a little clearer with our public on what we're talking about when we're putting together these pro uh, projects. Manitou's been working for 10 years or so to have a high-speed backbone. We have such manage has been working for about 10 years if you want to, to get high-speed internet citywide. We struggle to have coverage. And this has been going on for a long time. And I, I wasn't here 10 or eight years ago when this was developed, but I, I would bet that this was on their mind of trying to get communications through city. Mr. Chair, can I add on um, and maybe help answer this question? Um, in fact, I just went to a training class yesterday. One of the things we're seeing as an evolution in transportation is the integration of fiber optics into our transportation network, um, whether it's through the cable like what uh, Dole's presenting today, and they're even looking at things being like embedded and meshed with our, with our pavement services is for communication. It, and it's, the general purpose is kind of highlighting what may be helpful. And you'll see more of this in the future is connected vehicles vehicles that are connected to each other, vehicles that are connected to our infrastructure. We're also going to be using this, and I don't know if this is Manitou Springs, but I know the city standpoint, you know, we use fiber optic cables to connect our signals and to continue to improve that in evolution. So we're getting inundated with fiber optic needs in our transportation system. So even though Dole might be the first one to bring it up, I, I wouldn't be surprised if all of us would be bringing some, some kind of fiber optic uh, potential in our presentations in the future. Yeah. I'd just like to say one comment, sort of follow on with what you just said, Gail. I mean, you can drive anywhere in the city or the county, fountain. It seems like every place you go, you've got fiber optic contractors um, putting fiber optic cables, you know, underground. So it is becoming 
a normal utility, I guess you might say. As you indicated, it's becoming, you know, a, a daily or normal type of uh, utility along with uh, gas and everything else. And, you know, sorry, uh, in this, you know, our schools in Manitou struggle with having enough um, capacity because they have one fiber that runs to the schools. So this also will help the schools when their Comcast contract expires. So, I mean, this is, this is, there's a lot of work for us ahead of this, but this is a big deal for us. Yes. Um, and, and we do have um, a hand up in chat. I'm going to go ahead and highlight uh, Mr. Dave. Uh, uh, thank you all very much. I'd just like to, to echo actually what Ms. Thurvitt was saying and uh, wholeheartedly support uh, Dole's uh, proposal here. Uh, the reason being, I think, largely, uh, in, fact, in fact, I would even go one beyond. Uh, uh, Gail summed it up perfectly. I could not have done that better, actually, Gail, for, for the way you framed the, uh, the issue. I would even offer to go one step further and uh, come just short of a requirement for all public works projects. Pick a size and put some side boards on them. But, uh, but we, we should be putting in fiber optic conduit as cheap as it is when you've got the road torn apart in everything we do all the time. You may not need it for 10, 20 years, but uh, our infrastructure will last 100 plus years and we cannot be more forward thinking. Uh, and, and I think it'd be irresponsible for us not to do something. I'm not saying we need a new mandate, but I think it's probably time to seriously reconsider uh, doing exactly what Dole is doing in Manitou and do that throughout the entire area. So Gail, good on you, Dole. Thank you, congratulations. And I, as I said, I wholeheartedly support exactly what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, we do also have one more hand up, um, Ms. Tamara. Hi, I just wanted to just uh, give my support to what Dave just said and Gail. I think it is the future. This is, you know, fiber is part of our daily utilities that we need to function nowadays. So I 100% support this as well. All right, Ed, did you have a comment? Yeah, a question for you, Rick. Uh, obviously, Manitou has this spelled out under utilities uh, down the road, say the county or the city of Colorado Springs wants to do this. Do they have to have it spelled out as well for PPRTA funds? <clears throat> this might be a precedent. It's probably a question for, for Jennifer Ivey, our attorney, but I'm... I'm <clears throat> You're catching me off guard, but I'm going to say that it probably could be included without the use of utilities um, based on, um, but that's just a guess right now. And we'd have to uh, I get, just want to get a legal basis because I'm all for it, but I don't want somebody else to come back and say, technically, you didn't have this in there. Yeah. It's in the state law. Understood. So... Um, I, I think each member government staff could argue it's, it's a utility covered in the state law. And even though we member government staff X, um, says, <clears throat> uh, our, our capital project name doesn't include, uh, water, sewer, electric, and, and phone, it, it might, <clears throat> uh, they uh, they could say because all of the other utilities are assumed uh, to be in any of our capital projects that that would include fiber optic. And yeah. can I add on to um, for the city just to give you an example? We were already including fiber optic conduit in our standard street sections. Um, to show that there's going to be a requirement. Um, and we also require it on anything that's a collector and above that basically to link our, tra our traffic signals together as well. So you're going to see that more and more of the standard. And as Rick was saying, it's just part of any kind of road construction project. Um, so I think that you're going to see that it's very standard moving forward. Do you have any other comments to make? No, thank you. Do I hear any other comments? You again? No. <laughs> I'm ready to make a motion. <laughs> oh, in that case, <laughs> uh, looking for a motion for approval for these uh, three items from Manager I, Springs. I move for approval of all three items. Okay, Tony has moved for approval for the three That's items perfect, for yeah. Manitou Springs. Ed I would second that. Has uh, already uh, seconded the motion. So we have a 
um, the motions for approval for these three items from Manitou Springs. All in favor say aye. 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 Do I have anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, the next item up are transportation. Monthly update. Good afternoon, Brian Vitulli, a transit planning supervisor with Mountain Metro Transit and the city of Colorado Springs with your monthly transit update. So for our local fixed route services, uh, we provided over, well, close to 303,000 one-way trips in August of this year. Um, we still have a few routes that are running reduced frequency based on the uh, ongoing driver shortage. Um, and, and as you remember, at the end of last month's report, I um, gave you some updated information on the Zero Fare for Better Air campaign that was uh, run during the month of August. So um, to kind of back that up for uh, just this past August, our fixed route services were 64% um, higher than August of 2021, which is great. Um, but, you know, August 2021, we we're still suffering pretty greatly from, from COVID. Um, and only about um, two and a half percent below August of 2019, which was pre-COVID. So it, uh, all in all, it was a very successful campaign. And uh, you know, we, we look forward to having the opportunity to apply for grant funds for, for next August to, to take part in this campaign as well. For our ADA power transit services, we provided uh, just shy of 11,000 trips of August of 2022. And our ADA paratransit service was also part of the Zero Fare for Better Air camp campaign. So, so that service was free as well. Um, so August of 2022 had a 25.6% uh, increase over August of 21 and only 15.7% uh, below August of 2019. For our specialized paratransit taxi choice option, um, we, uh, we provided 116 passenger trips, which was an increase over the previous month, July of 2022 of 27%. Um, but it was, you know, quite a bit higher from August of 2021 when that program was still just kind of ramping back up from being discontinued for a while during COVID. And finally, our van pool services. Um, during August of this year, we operated six vans, uh, which made or provided 907 uh, one-way trips. So that was an increase of just about 3% as compared to August of 2021, but still down quite a bit from August of 2019. So that's all I have for you for this month. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Question. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, Brian, just one quick question. So that number for August is awesome for the fixed uh, fixed ridership, um, and I know it was a uh, the free fare for that mm -hmm. for that month, right? Has there been any preliminary? Have you do you have any preliminary numbers saying that people are that it's going to maintain that even with the money back on their fares for September? Yeah, you know we just. Uh, since September just ended, we were just starting to dip into what that ridership looks like. And um, there still seems to be quite a bump, um, you know, not as not as high as August, but um, it, it does seem to have kind of, you know, carried into September. Um, Reminded so, people how nice it is to get on the bus. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, th that's what we're hoping, you know, that August, you know, it kind of nudged people to, to go in that direction and try something different. And um, you know, but then again, trying to uh, qualify it a little bit, you know, the summer months are generally our higher ridership months. And, uh, you know, the, as you can see from the, the fixed route graph, you know, we, we have been trending upwards pretty much all, all season here. So 
could be a continuation of that, but it could also be a continuation of more people being exposed during that that free pre August month. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I look forward to uh, presenting this to you next month, and we can we can see what that ridership looks like. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for Brian? All right. Thank Here you very much. much. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, moving on to the next item. This is just an information item. City of Colorado Springs monthly change order and property acquisition report. Any questions on that? Hearing none, we'll move on to um, item number 7C. Uh, and I presume, Gail, you're going to present this? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Gail Servant, City of Colorado Springs. Um, what I provided in your packet is a cover memo and then a draft letter, but uh, what I'm asking today is for uh, the CAC's recommendation to the board to provide a letter of support uh, for the City of Colorado Springs grant application for replacement of the Water Street Bridge over Camp Creek area. Um, this is a project, I don't remember the exact age of this bridge, but the bridge is in very poor condition and there are a lot of complex utilities in that area. Uh, we do have a grant opportunity out there that's administered through the state. Um, and we are gonna be asking for funds uh, upwards in the total amount of $5 million. And we'd like to use some of our emergency bridge funds for the local match component of that. Any questions related to that project? Do we have any questions um, either in the room or online? I will just add in that it's the same project we applied for last year, but the state had very little money. We do have a little bit larger pool this year, so we're hoping to be successful with this opportunity. Uh, Rick Hoover, I have a motion to approve. Okay, Rick has moved to approve this item as presented by Gail. Do I have a second? A second. Oh, toss up. Mm -hmm. Give him okay, Tony has second. <laughs> okay, Tony has seconded the motion for approval of this item as presented by Gail. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. All right, next item we have, this is just information. Um, the monthly change order and property acquisition report from El Paso County. Um, oh, I guess we don't have anything there either, do we? I will say this is the calm before the storm. We're expecting a very busy fall, so I figured I'd set the stage. And uh, I was always told you never leave anything blank. So I didn't want to just not include our log. <laughs> so it, it was purposeful. All right, thanks, Josh. All right, the uh, next item is 8A. Uh, this will be Rick uh, report of recent board actions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the, uh, the highlight there is number four in my memo that the uh, board approved a revenue estimate for um, budget year, uh, or, which is also a fiscal year, uh, 2023 of 150 million. So uh, as you well know, that's down from our current 156 million this year. But as you can see, as you saw, from Lisa's financial report, <clears throat> we're in a little bit of a downward uh, trend. For, uh, the, you know, the first few months we were exuberant and and thought the trend would continue. That's why the CAC and the board added the six million, <clears throat> but uh, now that's at risk. So, and so <clears throat> we don't know where the economy's headed, um, and and how long it's gonna stay down. So that's why uh, Lisa recommended the board and board approved the 150 million down from the current 156. Um, 
I think that's about it from the highlights from the last board meeting. Any questions? Okay, any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next item. And this is Rick also, and that is appointment reappointment process for the uh, CAC. If my records are correct, <clears throat> the uh, following individuals uh, terms are coming up uh, December 31 of, of this year. As you recall, the uh, CAC members from member governments have terms, but no term limits of uh, the at-large regular and at-large alternates have terms, but they do have term limits. Uh, the the at-large regulars have three-year terms and the at-large alternates have two-year terms. <clears throat> so uh, Tamara from CTAB, uh, uh, if she wants to continue, needs to uh, talk to CTAB. Uh, Chair Larry Tobias needs to talk to the Highway Advisory Commission. Uh, Craig Gooding, Green Mountain Falls, Stephen Hart, City of Colorado Springs. So the, the four of you need to talk to your respective governments and your your appointment process if you want to continue and and uh, get me a letter uh, from the, your respective uh, member government saying that you're reappointed if, if you choose to be reappointed. Now with regard to that large alternate uh, uh, CAC member Carlos Perez, uh, my uh, records indicate this is the second full term for Carlos, uh, so not eligible for reappointment. Uh, as an alternate. Um, uh, Ryan Bissiger uh, is just his first full term as an alternate, so he can request to be reappointed for a second term. And there's one vacant at large alternate seat. Um, so, and, and we do have two applicants uh, who have expressed interest in the last six months uh, <clears throat> if there are any vacancies. So, the, the board and the board's uh, subcommittee will decide if they want to advertise in addition to that two applicants or just interview the two applicants. So that'll be their decision next week. So this is just uh, information uh, regarding uh, CAC members who uh, whose terms are up and need to take some action regarding uh, reappointment. Questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, Rick, the next item is the staff field review report. And this is the result of my uh, windshield survey, driving around, checking on what the uh, member governments have, have um, declared that they've completed in the second calendar quarter of 2022. And in... 99.999% of the cases, it's correct uh, that uh, what they've reported is um, <clears throat> is what I found. So the few minor uh, discrepancies I've highlighted uh, with pen and ink. Just information, uh, any questions? Any questions for Rick on uh, the field review report that he gives us? I just just a comment that that is an awful lot of projects. Word of uh, time and mileage. What what kind of investment do you have on that? Um, time is probably um, twenty hours per quarter, and. Um, uh, reimbursement mileage reimbursement is probably three hundred dollars per quarter. Wow, that information that detail is pretty impressive. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Rick on his report? All right. Hearing none, now we'll go to item number nine agenda topics for the next meeting. Do we have uh, any agenda topics that uh, we need to include? Rick? Well, uh, 
normal and routine will be the uh, your budget workshop where you go over the budget in detail. But it it's uh, first going to be delivered to the board next week uh, by Lisa, and then both the CAC and the board will hold their budget workshops at your November meetings. Uh, yes, Larry. Uh... I don't know if this is appropriate or not. <clears throat> the, uh, as I look around the room, uh, I see a very small number of our PPRTA Citizen Advisory Committee members. Now, I do see that there is a, a, a goodly number online. And then there, of course, there are some absences. Uh, I would like to encourage at this point that uh, my our colleagues that are not here start attending. I think uh, we, they, if they have objections or uh, they will bring that up uh, online, and uh, we have heard uh, some very nice and accurate comments from members that are not here. But you lose a lot by not coming to the meetings in person. And I am a very strong advocate uh, of attending meetings. And uh, I would encourage at this stage uh, the members, and uh, I would remind all that prior to the pandemic, uh, to be present, I believe you had to be here. Is that not correct, Rick? It is. Uh, that is not the case now. You can, uh, by being online, you can be present. And I would rather have that than you uh, not even uh, uh, be available online. But I would really love to see more of our colleagues attend in purpose. And so I'm not going to ask that that be put on the agenda, uh, but I felt this might be a good place to at least raise that point and uh, uh, I miss seeing more of our colleagues here. All right, thank you for your comments, Richard. Uh, uh, this is Rick. Uh, yes. This question is for Rick. Uh, do we, uh, when are we going to do something about the time change? That will be the uh, next item up on the agenda. Oh, I missed it. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Do we have any other comments or questions? Hearing none. And as indicated, uh, the November meeting will be a review of the budget for 2023. So that will be um, a major item that we will have on the agenda for the November meeting. All right, communications. I'm going to turn this over to Rick. He, this will be uh, his follow-up on his email that he sent out um, looking at uh, changing our start time of the CAC meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, floating uh, via the email and then bringing it up uh, th this month, and next month uh, to see if there's any objections to changing our uh, CAC meeting start time back to 1.30 uh, instead of the current one o'clock to see if there's any objections. I, I wanna just take two months and uh, three months, uh, October, November, December, and, and make sure uh, everybody's on board with it and no objections before we uh, change it over in January. Uh, any, any discussion, any, Mr. Uh, Chair, yeah. any negatives? No, I fully support the idea. So in my way of thinking, yeah, let's do it. One thirty is actually more convenient for me. It allows a little longer lunch and travel time to get there by one thirty. 
Who is making those uh, that, comments, uh, please? Dave, we couldn't quite, quite hear you. I need more volume, please. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just like wanted oh, to say Dave, that I no, okay. support that. All right. Thank you, Dave. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I could, yeah, just speak on that. Yeah, I really, uh, you know, supportive of that, but the original motivation to go from 1.30 to 1 o'clock was to give staff more time to prepare for the week, uh, next week's meeting for the board meeting. And so it was really... When we moved it, it was really on your behest to have that extra 30 minutes would was uh, uh, necessary, I think, uh, to to prepare the packet and get it out to the board. Um, so I'm here to support the staff is my position. So if 1.30 is uh, OK with everyone, I can take 1.30, but I'm here daily to support you and make sure you have enough time to prepare whatever it is you need for next week. And if we have to meet at 1, I'd still be OK with that. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking that really as a kind of a rhetorical question. Sure. What what's changed here uh, from I from last we, uh, when we changed it from one I think one thirty to one? Uh, learned how to streamline our process, and we've also switched in the last couple of years uh, during uh, COVID from paper agenda packets uh, the to electronic packets for for the board, so that saves. Uh, hour, hour and a half of uh, not having to walk around the table and collate the, the board packets on on Thursday afternoon. So um, I, I appreciate your excellent memory. Uh, uh, but I, I think since we've uh, gone to streamlining with electronic packets that we can, we can now afford to let people have a more leisurely lunch before we uh, start the meeting. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, again, just be cognizant of your time. Yes. Um, you know, what you're putting into this is absolutely fantastic. And I didn't want to affect anything related to staff, you know, leaving at 5 or 5.30. And that was uh, sure. just really my position is I'm, I'm here to support you on this. So whatever time works for you, for the staff, uh, I will support that. And if you want, if you think it's a good idea to go ahead and move it to 1.30 or we can't do that, then I would be supportive of that as well. Thank you. All right, just a... Final comment from the uh, chairman um, from a discussion with Rick, sort of following over, you know, some of the items that he just discussed is that they've streamlined the process. And so they don't quote, I guess you might say, they don't need that extra time that was requested originally. As such, uh, as chairman, uh, actually vice chairman, but chairman today, vice chairman normally, um, I do support. Uh, Rick and uh, the change back to uh, 1.30. Uh, we will have a formal vote, but I just wanted to uh, say that uh, I support the change back to 1.30 as of uh, the January meeting. There have been several emails that have been sent out that have also supported it. Um, you know, we will have a final formal vote, uh, but as of yet, I have not seen any or heard of any negative comments uh, relative to the request uh, from Rick to make that change back to 1.30. Yes, Gail. Um, I hopefully you've all received the save the date um, that the city of Colorado Springs will be hosting um, a ribbon cutting event on October 28th. We'll be opening Centennial Boulevard for traffic, that extension that runs up from Van Buren near the VA hospital down to I-25. So that will be an exciting connection for our, our transportation network. <laughs> you know, I October 28th, yeah. I just like to say one thing. Uh, I just like to say one thing. Uh, over the years on the different committees that I've served on uh, relative to the roads uh, in this area, it's been so long since the Centennial Project has been identified, it just seems kind of strange that we're actually getting it done and it's going into operation, but I'm glad we're doing that. All right, any other comments? Any other questions? With that, uh, I move for adjournment of the meeting. Tony, Ed, seconds. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, 
The CAC meeting is adjourned at 2.05 p.m. Thank you everyone for participating, uh, whether it is on uh, Zoom or whether it's here in um, actual physical room.